Well, howdy do, buckaroos. This is Joe Layden of Cowboys and Indians Magazine. And today I'm in the CNI studio with Grant Major, the Oscar winning production designer of Lord of the Rings. The, uh, let's see, which one of the Rings movies was that? It was Fellowship of the Rings or was it? The first one was The Fellowship of the Ring. But you won your Oscar for? Uh, for the uh, Return of the King, which is there the third go. Oscar. That's there right. Can't, can't keep track of these rings without a scorecard. <laughs> and he is largely responsible for creating of a visual look, the world, if you will, of Jane Campion's extraordinary film, The Power of the Dog. Now, uh, Grant, you had not worked uh, with Ms. Campion since uh, the extraordinary film Angel at My Table that uh, introduced the world to Carrie Fox. Uh, is she still a hard taskmaster? Yes, she is, in every sense of the word, actually. I mean, she's not, a, um, she's not difficult to work for. She just requires a lot of um, intellectual um, collaboration, and um, she's very... Uh, keen on create uh, on a creative group around her so she cultivates this sort of um, group of people that she you know we become a family I guess for a period of time so she's yeah she's fantastic mm. well now you created this this world uh this California world uh several hundred miles away did you not across the world yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I've never been to Montana, unfortunately. I'd love to. Um, Jane and the producer Tanya Sagatian did go to Montana with the view to making the film there. Uh, the also um, the rights to the film were owned by a Canadian gentleman who also wanted to make it in the state above Montana. I can't quite remember the, the uh, Canadian area just above there, but um, there was, Jane felt at the time, as it was told to me, that the, the world of the 1920s in Montana has changed quite a lot. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the sort of, um, that period sort of quality that she wanted for, for the film, she couldn't find very easily there. And I guess there were other reasons, which I'm not involved with, you know, production reasons for bringing it to New Zealand. It would be to do with funding partly as well. Um, uh, and New Zealand has been used quite a lot for other parts of the world, locations for other parts of the world. I mean, I did Mulan, which is another film I was I production designed as China uh, in the Tang Dynasty in, in New Zealand. I've, I've, it's been used for Switzerland. It's been used for all sorts of places. But it's not to say that it's nowhere in particular, but it does have these beautiful um, sort of virgin landscapes, if you like, of um, wilderness and grasslands and things like that, that we thought, you know, could be a good fit for Montana. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully that worked out for the audience that they, you know, there's a, an amount of belief that you're there, I hope. Well, obviously I misspoke myself or misremembered it's not California, it's Montana. Montana yeah. uh, I think uh, I went, rattled my memories of mentioning the a Burbank mansion uh, it, that uh, plays a significant part. Uh, I, I always think of Burbank, you know, where they have TV shows <laughs> in California. But um, when you are approaching uh, the design of uh, the world, um, I keep going back to this word, the world, and this is a period. Uh, do you find yourself, you know, just spending hours, days, months going through, I don't know, Sears and Roebuck catalogs from that period, uh, reference books, photographs, because, uh, you know, there's always going to be some nitpicker in the audience because, oh, wait, they didn't have uh, that kind of doorknob until 1933 or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> we have to be very, very, very careful. But Sears and Roebuck, it's interesting that you brought that up, actually, because we did scrutinize those magazines. And um, interestingly, they used to um, sell them here in New Zealand as well. You know, we used to get mail order stuff from Sears and Roebuck at the same time. 
in New Zealand, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's different, but it's also very similar. And, you know, the technologies and the, all those sort of door handles and all those sorts of bits and bobs, you'll find that um, here in New Zealand, um, we use the same things. So, um, you know, we have to be very careful with this. And I do, do immerse myself in that period detail because it's, um, it's fascinating, actually, when you actually look very, very carefully at these photographs. Um, we actually used a photographer, Evelyn Cameron, who was a, um, uh, I suppose, a prairie wilderness photographer from uh, Montana and around the turn of the 1900s. Um, and just before, she uh, documented her life on the farms and the ranches at that time, but they had a particular style to them. The, the way that the the um, those broad um, Montana landscapes do tend to isolate things in the frame. Um, you tend to sort of notice the outlines a lot of people because they've got these big open landscapes behind them. You know the the wide um, uh, uh, horizon lines and things like that. So these items sort of get plonked on the landscape. Uh, these buildings get plonked on the landscape. People animals and things like that. And it's had a particular kind of style to it that I was very, that Jane in particular and I were very interested in um, um, trying to copy um, in, in the film. So you'll see the Burbank house as it appears in the, in the film has just really just been placed on the landscape with very little else around it. It's almost like the, the sort of the, 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 the um, weather conditions and the, the, um, the heat and the dust and the sun doesn't allow for fancy gardens and and you know little clipped hedges and things like that. Um, it's it's just <laughs> a simple um, uh, juxtaposition of architecture on big open landscape. It's a very interesting um, visual motif and it's got, it works in very well with the narrative of the story too. I think we're going to to the narrative of the story now. Uh, I would imagine in your position, I mean you're, you're like the, the the fellow at the circus who's keeping all of these different plates spinning on all of these different sticks because, okay, you've got to make your sets true to the period. You also have to remember people are going to have to walk in and out of them and they're going to be shooting a movie in there. So you have to have room for the camera, the, the lighting and such and such. And also you want to let us know a little bit about the characters by, you know, what, you know, what their bedroom might be like, mm. uh, what their sitting room might be like uh, early on, you know, what that saloon might be like. I mean, you know, okay, these are rowdy guys who are going in there, but there's a sensitive fellow there. So how, how do you, you know, how do you keep all those plates spinning? <laughs> yeah, good question, man. I mean, that that is what production design is. That you've hit the nail on the head. It is making these environments that bolster the characters and talk about the story. So, you know, the story, as we experience it in the films, gets told on many different levels. You know, there's the, on the top, there's the, there's the verbal interaction, if you like, you know, the, the dialogue that happens in between the characters. And then there's a psychological coming together of these different situations of the characters. And then there's all the, the sort of situation of the world itself. So at the beginning of The Power of the Dog, you know, we've sort of, um, the way that the family has sort of arrived on that landscape and on that farm is being told through all those sort of clues that you get through the um, through through the architecture. So you know the the um, the house itself would have been built in the maybe the eighteen eighties. Um, it's a piece of architecture that comes from the eastern states. So it's like a, it's almost like an early craftsman style, which would have been very fancy and very trendy back in Chicago or you know New York State or something like that. And it's been and the the parents of um, the, the two boys who live on the farm have bought this aesthetic out and bought this idea out, um, and they're going to become gentlemen farmers, <laughs> gentlemen ranchers. Um, but of course, the reality of uh, the reality of being on the farm and all those sort of climactic things and all the social things that happen have paired every paired all the fancy stuff back and then you've just really left with this this the the big grand big boned house that's sort of on, on, on this landscape but it's also got a very dark interior so it's got there's a very moody 
kind of masculine world inside. And that's really synonymous with the, the character that now um, has that place under his thumb, and that's Phil Burbank. So the, the, the eldest son, has um, he's got a dark side to him, if you like. Um, and and so you know we very that's much like politely. That's putting it politely. Yeah. So it's um, you know it's manifested very very well in the way that's sort of dark against dark almost. You know a lot of the a lot of the interior shots in that in that um, in those rooms, those big big empty rooms are uh, very sort of um, uh, this little sort of chiaroscuro, the little bits of light against lots of dark and and things. So it's a yeah, I mean, we try to play out all these things to bolster these sorts of psychological things. Um, I was also, you, you mentioned the, the bar, actually, not many people have asked me about the bar before. You know, I did spend a lot of time looking at photographs of um, Wild West um, drinking establishments back then. And not many of them were built for purpose. You know, a lot of them were repurposed, repurposed, um, rooms that might have been made for something else you know and so we thought oh, that'd be kind of cool to be able to make the the bar um a, a revamped um engineering shed or something like that which is exactly what we what we did you know and so we we brought in a few the bar itself which has looked like it'd been knocked together out of a few other things and brought in a few sort of odd other odd items but essentially the thing was it was not the saloon like we know it with the sort of the doors swinging and, the, and all the purpose made things. It was actually a little more down down market than that. And it sort of spoke a little bit of the, the sort of um, isolated small town railhead um, towns that might have been made at the time. So, you know, again, you know, trying to add nuance and sort of character to things that maybe uh, were a little different to what people's preconceptions of these things were. And you spoke of you know the darkness at the at the, at the house, and yet when a woman is introduced to this world, yes, very subtly. I mean, it's not like suddenly you know you open the door and the sun shines in and bluebirds fly into the place and things like that. But there's a sense that this world might be changing. Yeah, well, look that the. the it's interesting that because, um, as I've mentioned before, you know, the, the house is very masculine and it's very much dominated by this alpha male and Phil Burbank. When Rose gets introduced to the house, she's very much at odds with her surroundings. She comes from quite a different social strata. Mm -hmm. Stepping into the house of one of the most wealthy people in the state would be something like, it's, it's like another world to her. She comes in... Um, Full of love with her new husband and and she that gets truncated very quickly by phil who sort of stamps his kind of personality on onto her and, and sort of um sets the boundaries of her very quickly so she fairly quickly um um sort of retreats into a room that we hadn't seen before in the house which is the parents room the parents um you know when they packed up and left to go into retirement in salt lake city um they left the house and actually took a lot of the furniture with them which is why the house generally is fairly empty but they did leave the um the master bedroom which would have been created as a sort of a sanctuary for mrs burbank the old lady as she's called in the film um <laughs> you know for her um eastern um you know having come from the eastern states like we mentioned She's been supplanted onto this cattle ranch now, and and I think that the that that room would have been a sanctuary for her, you know, for for uh, Mrs. Burbank. Now that Rose and um, George have moved into this, the parents' bedroom, it's the one room that's got a feminine charm to it. But it's also, to me, a room that um, is a little overpowering as well. You know, it's a the the wallpaper in there is quite sort of loud, <laughs> and the 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 uh, even the bed, bed furniture and all the furniture in there is very big and sort of overbearing in a way. So I think there's a, to me, it, it is a, it is her sanctuary, but it's also like quite sort of suppressive on her, on her um, mood. And it's, there's nowhere in a way in that house that gives her peace. She's always being stalked by Phil and there's no escape in some ways. Because, you know, 
I don't often think about this, you know, because most, let's face it, most films you see are contemporary films and this never crosses your mind. But any kind of period film, uh, you know, there are times when I think, particularly Westerns, you know, it's like, well, gosh, how did they get that out there? I mean, what was the process? I mean, you know, and then not just in isolated houses. I mean, you know, most Westerns you'll see, you know, oh, I don't know, uh, the, the piano in the bar. You know, I always wonder, well, how did they get a piano shipped out there? I mean, you know, did they go to the Sears and Roebuck catalog and order a piano? I think they probably did. You know, because, I mean, the piano, that, the piano you were referring to there was um, in the town of Beach, which has a railway line, that's the railhead. And I, I assume that you're able to, at the time, and maybe you, you're a better authority than me to be able to talk about this, you're able to write away to Sears and Roebuck or these, these other um, shops and they'd box it up and send it out. Um, I imagine there must be a lot of freight like that going on all the time. Mm -hmm. One of the scenes that was cut from our film was the, the mail truck arriving at the Burbank Ranch. Um, so, you know, there would have been, there would have been serviced, these ranches that were quite isolated would have been serviced by the US mail and, um, and they would be um, delivered all these, all these objects. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, I think it's an interesting time period, the 1925. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like, and again, you're a bit of authority on this than me, but the, the sort of Wild West would have been sort of in its very latter stages, I'd imagine. And by 1925, <laughs> um, these sort of services and connections and, and um, things would have been a lot more um, prevalent at, at then. You know, there was, there was electricity. There was, yes. telephone, there was um, you know, cars. But there's still cattle drives and there's still cowboys and it was still very labor intensive. So it's a very beautiful sort of crossover period between the sort of um, the, the sort of culture that we're living in now and this prior time, which was a lot more pioneering. So, yeah, I, I hope that the story sort of brought out this sort of um, meeting of the two of these two crossover lines. period, really, is, you know, an evolution, you know. Hmm past you know it's like i tell uh my film students when i show them uh the great train robbery you know uh this actually is almost like a, a docudrama i mean this is you know 1912 1913 they were still robbing trains i mean you know butch and sundance were still alive i mean they may have been you know down south of the border but uh you know they conceivably could have gone to a movie theater and you know, seen a movie based on their lives. That's right. And they get their photograph taken, you know, with that sort of new technology as it would have been back then. So, yeah, that's, that's fascinating, isn't it? It's great. Yeah. Was there anything uh, you wanted to do that after you did a little bit of research, you said, oh, no, I can't show that. I can't have that because that hasn't been invented yet or that really wouldn't fit into this period. I don't think so. No, we re really, um, you know, by the time we actually get to make and uh, make the sets and collect all those things together, we've got a very clear idea about what the, um, you know, what would have been around at the time. And we base all of our ideas on that. I mean, a lot of it is to do with camera. I mean, everything that I do as a production designer, I build the sets and design the sets and bring all the furniture and the dressings and all that sort of stuff together, but everything is filtered through that camera lens. And so, um, you know, a lot of the sort of design aspects are uh, ca catering towards them. Um, there, are, there are the house that you see in the film it's a very big house and it's got three stories essentially. We never built physically built the top story of that because that would have been over budget. And <laughs> in terms of the engineering of the house, um, it would have meant you know x amount more um, sort of uh, uh, materials and engineering uh, all, and all that sort of stuff. So that was left to the physical, visual effects department to sort of add on that sort of top story. <clears throat> Even having said that. To be able to stand up such a large house in the valley that we chose as a location was very difficult because it was a very very windy it was one of the windiest valleys in the country actually and um, so it needed a lot of structural um, thought put into um, footings and you know 
it's just a facade after all. The interiors were built in the studio, but the, the house itself was built um, just as an empty shell. The, um, the, uh, the barn was built interior and exterior, <coughs> excuse me. And um, the various outbuildings were interiors and exteriors, but um, yeah, I mean, everything is just very ephemeral for this, for this as well. You know, we build these things and they're gone, you know, they were, they were gone uh, within three or four months and there was nothing left there. And um, the farmer wanted his grass back, interestingly. You know, we had to put uh, organic desiccant on the green grass that was there because it's a sheep farm, sheep and cattle farm. So we had to knock everything back to make it feel like it was more sort of um, dry, dusty sort of place. And then... Uh, so then you had like drovers waiting impatiently just off camera, you know. Yeah, yeah, we did. Like, hey, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Yeah. yeah, they did. They were, they, the farmer was like ready to pounce back onto that piece of land as soon as we had moved <laughs> out. And, uh, he wanted his grass back, that's for sure. Mm. But we were lucky, big fun, we were lucky with him because the farm we came to had cattle on it, you know, so the, the farmer was very much involved in the film by helping us brought his cattle on, was helping to wrangle the cattle within the yards and things like that. It was fantastic. Well, finally, um, after this experience, are you looking forward to you shopping around to do a Western or uh, I mean, a, a, a real Western as opposed to a Western flavored period mm -hmm. film? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'd very much like to do that. Actually, I've learned a lot about it now, and, the, and there's something about there's something about human endeavour on the landscape that I found I find very sort of primal and very interesting. And so, um, yeah, I, I think bring it on. And um, you know, we have a lot to offer in New Zealand in terms of these landscapes. We've got very good horsemen. We've got very good um, builders and set builders and and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, if, if, if there's any out there on your audience that are filmmakers and wanna um, get involved with that, that'd be great. I can come to America too, and I can do a Western there. So there we go, I'd love to do that, love to. Well, thank you very much for your time. Good luck to you. And uh, who knows, not too long from now, you may have another glittering prize for your mantelpiece. That'd be wonderful. For the power of the dog. Thank you. Thank you very much.